Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining our third web webinar, Leveraging Digital in the Charity Sector. I'm delighted to welcome you all and to, to, to welcome our panel and, and thank them in advance for joining us today. So I'd like to introduce them. I'm going to be correct and introduce them in, in alphabetical order. So I'm going to start with Becky Curtis, who is Monitoring and Impact Officer at Jersey Overseas Aid. She's overseeing over 40 projects far and wide, so I'm guessing digital's pretty important to, to her. W welcome, Becky. Thank you very much. And uh, also Michelle Gray, who's doing great work a bit closer to home at Jersey Biodiversity Centre. That's a great initiative. And um, I think it gives us all the opportunity to contribute to protecting biodiversity in Jersey. So, so welcome, Michelle. But we got you there. Well, whilst Michelle finds some, I think she might have to find the mute button, I'll carry on. And uh, I'd like to introduce Ed Proud. Ed's co-founder of Pottery Sh The Potting Shed, TechX, and, and Unity, which is, Unity is quite an exciting development for the third sector, and I guess we'll talk about it a bit later uh, in, this, in this webinar. Thanks and last, me. but most certainly not least, is R Rory Steele. Uh, Rory's I'm sure well known to you all. He's head of the Digital Jersey Academy um, and he's been in teaching before that at Bolia. Um, the Academy is another great initiative to help us all in our, in our future digital lives. Welcome, Rory. Good afternoon. Righty ho, let's get down to it. Um, I'm going to start with the the questions, and I'm going to start with you, with you, Rory. Um, so, in terms of the current lay of the land, are charities geared up for, for a digital world, and and how important will digital leadership be in the next five years? Well, I think technologically, you know, things are in place. The, the tools are out there. I think the biggest challenge isn't just with charities, it's with every business around, is the people themselves. And, you know, it's, it's why I moved after, you know, over 20 years of teaching into Digital Jersey Academy. It's that upskilling piece. It, it's going to be a long road. You know, Jersey's no further behind uh, than anyone else. Sometimes we think it is, but I, I talk to people from the Southern Hemisphere, Americas, it, it's just the same everywhere digital talent is is at a premium and i suppose with charities because they rely quite heavily most of the time on uh, volunteers that turnaround is going to be quite large and so it's it, you i think some charities almost feel they're in a constant stage of training as somebody comes in getting used to the systems and that in itself is probably the biggest problem for, for charities in the digital world. Um, so one of the four key areas that Digital Jersey has in the five-year strategic plan is people. And, you know, we, we've been looking at the fiscal stimulus courses that have been running here. It's going to be nearly a thousand people trained this year on, on lots of different areas. And that's included a lot of charities. I've been chatting to people um, saying about where they can go and, and what they can do. And it, it's a lot of the case of saying, well, actually, there's a lot of free materials out there you know while everybody else is kind of in the the 365 world in the office and they're using all those tools which are which are good tools there are also the google infrastructure where charities can work completely for free uh, and apply to do so they can run websites completely for free they can edit them uh, for free and with very little training so i don't think it's a case of uh, are they well placed i think they have the tools available it's about showing charities where what they can do how they can do it um, with the minimal training required uh, and and for me that's it it's, it's time and it's training and to, just to confirm Roy, some some of the digital academy programs are, are actually free to everybody is that is that correct 
Yeah, I mean, that's been the change this year with the government funding for fiscal stimulus that we have been able to do that. And by taking away the barrier of cost, the courses weren't ever that expensive, but they were a barrier for entry. We've now got over 50% of the course attendees are women. We've got good accessibility rates going through. And people have just said that, that if you're looking to change a job, it's, it's sometimes because of financial reasons. So having to lay out for a course and change that is, is a problem. And you know, charities, especially over the last 18 months, you know, don't have, you never, never had money to burn, but it, it, it's been never been more precious. And they'd rather put that money into the organization's charitable needs uh, rather than the training. And so to access the free stuff, I think has been really nice for them. And we've continued that conversation afterwards. Thank you. Um, Becky, what, what do you think about the, the, uh, that first question, the current lay of the land and if charities are actually geared up giving your, your international work? But I was just thinking this whole notion of, of training, really, I mean, a lot of charities that we work with not just look to train their staff and keep their, their staff and their volunteers informed, but they're also looking to sort of provide training as a form um, of capacity building, as a form of, in our sector, um, improving um, ability of people to combat poverty in their own lives. So, so that idea of actually use, using and harnessing digital to uh, improve um, the availability of training, the availability of resources, is something we're seeing a lot of, particularly since the COVID pandemic. We are seeing innovations in the realms of uh, providing what was in-person training, uh, digitally, remotely, resources now. Uh, in rural Zambia, uh, there are innovations where they're using digital, instead of putting volunteers on the ground, providing um, educational resources and training in, in hard copy and one-on-one, -on -one, we are seeing people using WhatsApp and Facebook to, to send videos and circulate them around rural farming communities so that people get access to educational resources, people get access to training at actually a much lower cost rate to the organisation. And actually it has the potential to be much more widespread. So even tr looking at how you're delivering training and how you're looking to sort of create the change you want to see as a charity, there are digital innovations in that that can really make a difference. Um, in your strategies. Thank you. Michelle, we've got the technical digital challenges sorted. So the thing, what, what, what do you think about this first, this first question about the future and how important digital leadership is going to be in the next five years? Um, yeah, so yeah, I fixed my uh, speaker problem. So <laughs> we're, we're back on track. Um, yeah, so yeah, with the just from a personal perspective of um, whether um, charities are set up um, for the digital future, um, I think perhaps it depends on the size of the charity. Certainly, from our perspective, and we're, we're quite small. I mean, we're, we are already set up quite well, but I think it's taking that first step um, to actually um, put 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 uh, resources into um, training people um, in. In, in digital because we do have quite a lot of members that aren't so um, up to date with the digital side of things. So um, I think it's just about taking, taking the time to take that first step um, in, in training people. And um, once you do that, if you can set aside some resources, it will be um, monumental in changing how your charity runs um, and how efficient you are. Thanks, Michelle. Ed, what, what, what's, what's your view about this, how important digital is going to be? Yeah, yeah thank you. I think the, the guys have um, set the scene perfectly. And I think, you know, the question is, are they geared up? And, and many certainly are. But it's, you know, if you imagine that the rate of digital evolution is so rapid, even, you know, a lot of the private sector struggled to keep up. So, um, you know, it's hard to expect them to sort of keep up that pace as well. So the, the key there is, is, as Rory highlighted, was making sure that it's easily signposted to the resources that are available, because uh, as you said, there's lots of um, free resource out there as well. Uh, and, and sort of beginning to shift the mindset, I believe, and, and being able to kind of have a vision of more parity between kind of the corporate world and the charitable world. And, you know, as you mentioned before, unity, um, in its efforts is, is, is starting to kind of close that gap, which could um, not only kind of present 
that um, digital opportunity and access, but um, hopefully make it a, a lot sort of more equitable. So I think if maybe just move on now, Ed, and staying with you. I mean, thinking about digital strategies and how, how charities might go forward, where do you think is a good place to start? Is, is it around communication or fundraising? Where, where's, where's the most obvious place for charities to start looking? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, again, I'd echo Rory again there. We've got Digital Jersey, which you know, really is an incredibly advanced um, sort of government quango and, and so well equipped um, via the academy and, and Rory here representing as the, the perfect kind of pillar to drive that. Um, you know, there are obviously businesses in the private sector, such as um, Potting Shed, and who who uh, involved in brand and digital communications. Who you know, we give a lot of pro bono effort to the third sector. Um, you know, that will certainly have charitable rates associated. So do seek these. I advise you to do seek these out. Um, you know, and I'd also recommend seeking out passionate individuals who who can give their time and skills and advisory boards. Um, Unity, whilst not a, a charity, um, has a sort of voluntary advisory board and, you know, we have digital and creative skills covered, but we've managed to surround ourselves with legal expertise and other technical expertise and, you know, uh, governance expertise. Um, so we're not a, a charity, but we're certainly purpose led and delivering positive um, things to the, to the community by, by proxy but but more specifically you know just some some bits of advice really you know really deeply research and understand your char uh, challenges as a charity um, deeply understand your audiences you know are they b2b are they b2c i imagine both um, and seek out those businesses who have a particular persuasion to your purpose um, they'll be your best ambassadors and in some instances market for you and empower them with your knowledge about your charity, involve them in the conversation and they'll begin spreading your energy by proxy. Also use the right and plentiful mediums, your website, uh, make sure it's addressing that audience that you've defined. Um, we have short attention spans and so that messaging and, and getting to the, the point of information has got to be compelling. Uh, as well as undertaking suitable social media activity. But, you know, I do come from a creative background, so I'm going to really push that message. You know, we've all got a right-hand brain, and I'd really encourage you to, to execute that amongst yourselves, amongst your kind of stakeholders. Um, you know, we are personally um, being asked to curate and help all our clients, our private sector clients, to be purpose-led. We can, it's, you know, that tidal wave of accountability is crashing in the, in the private sector. Uh, in fact, on Thursday, I'm giving a talk to 30 corporates about purpose-led behaviours. You know, as charities, by definition, you are purpose-led. Um, but it's still important that you find and follow that. And the good resources to start in that is Simon Sinek's What, How, Why process. Um, um, but do look that up. Um, but I do go back to creativity. It's deeply important to find your space to do this and, and drive innovative ways to, to undertake your behaviours in marketing. Uh, you know, take fundraising, for example, you know, with so many people vying for attention, it's creativity that will help you shine and stand out. Digital is therefore the mechanisms under which that creativity manifests. You know, for example, um, the, the, the potting shed came up with the concept of 30 days and 30 days, which was literally a creative initiative. And it was the digital that allowed us to, to execute that. So, yeah, create, measure um, and improve um, and, and look to reach out to those resources. Thanks, Ed. Um, I have to come to, to Rory to follow, follow up on that on that question. Where to yeah, start, yeah. Rory? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd echo what Ed said there, and thank you for those kind words as well before. Um, the, you, I think you've really got to find out what, what is the problem you're trying to solve? You know, a lot of people just assume that digital is going to solve all woes. Um, 
because it is efficient. It, it is the medium of choice for, for most people now to consume, but you need to prioritize, you know, is, is it the admin that's dragging you down? If it's the admin dragging you down, let's look at that. How can that be speed, they're sped up? Is it that you're not getting your message across through the marketing that that's quite, as said, quite uh, effectively there. And then you, you, there are ways in which you can use digital to help you out, but you also need to appreciate that sometimes this may, may sound strange, especially coming from this webinar, that sometimes digital isn't the, always the, the only solution. You know, it, it's a complementary solution. And especially in a community like Jersey, where getting the message quite often, the most effective one can be the radio during drive time. You know, the people are stuck in that traffic. They, they hear that stuff. They pick up the paper. The, the digital is there to complement what goes on. And, you know, it's just those little things about if you are going to put stuff on social media, it's the quality of the audio. It's the little bits, the little bobs that will do that. But it's also about, you know, who's your target audience? Because it's becoming increasingly difficult to, to narrow down that digital marketing for the youth sector, for example, where I, where I think Facebook is still very, very strong when it comes to, um, I won't say the older generation, but I consider myself in that, um, that they're there. And you've got your, your Twitter seem to be dying a death a little bit with different communities. It's the Instagram, that TikTok generation, really hard to permeate those, those areas. So it's, it's no point just saying I've done digital marketing because I've posted an Instagram post or I've done this. And it, it's just about having a strategy, as you've said, what is the problem you need solved and, and put all your efforts into those rather than just trying to scattergun approach, thinking that digital is going to solve all your issues. So, so in a way, what you're saying is some things don't change, sort of the strategy, strategy and communications, communication, and digital can Absolutely. sometimes just make you, help you do it better and uh, to, more, to, to more people. Yeah. The compl to complement rather than replace. Yeah, I think. Sorry, just to just to just a thought on that as well. Um, what, you know, once you have got that deep understanding of who you are um, and that kind of what, how, why DNA piece, your your identity, it will become so much easier to communicate, um, uh, and therefore your audience will have so much more empathy when that sort of authentic true to self message does go out as well. And, and on that point, I suppose to add from our perspective, well, one of the things that we've been discussing as well within our own organization is like you say, when developing a communication strategy, also understanding what you are currently doing and the way that digital, uh, perhaps, you know, analytics of your website, um, a review of your social media to stand, uh, can help inform you as to what you're currently achieving, who your current audiences are, and then you can sort of look at your strategy, see what's working, what isn't working, and, and design sort of a more effective campaign based on your knowledge of your previous activities, learning from them, and, and going forward to communicate better, uh, because that accountability is required now increasingly, and rightly so, from, from this sector. Um, and being able to convey effectively to the right people the right messages is vital. Thanks, Becky. I mean, do you, do you think it sort of, to what extent does it replace the good old fashioned meeting real people and all that? I suppose you know, I'm a bit of an analog person rather than a digital person. So I think sort of I'm, I, I like, I guess many others miss the opportunity, especially for creativity about actually meeting people in the, you know, so I think. Well, I, I, I think Rory covered that a little bit as well by, it, it's really easy in the pace in which um, the digital world takes our attention as the kind of silver bullet. Um, and we are a long, long way off that degree of automation. And so we will be, and importantly, living in a hybrid world where that face-to-face -face is just as rich, if not as important as the digital communications. And um, long may that continue. Yeah. And, and from a data perspective, you can obtain that knowledge and that understanding through a mixture of speaking to people on the street, holding sort of focal group discussions with sort of key audiences and sending out digital surveys, which create a sort of perhaps more of a quantitative data that you can sort of look through and analyze. It doesn't have to be sort of high tech. It, it could just be sort of a range of approaches to just it's just about understanding genuinely uh, what the people on the street think about your organization and using that information to say, are we reaching the right people? Do people know us? Do people understand us? And are people hearing what we have to say? And do they believe in, in, in our objectives? That's a relief, Becky, for us old folk sort of thing. <laughs> can, can I come to Michelle? Michelle, what, 
What do you think? Yeah, I mean, some of these points are um, quite apt for us at the moment because kind of I'm going through quite a big um, process of actually looking at who we are, um, who we are trying to target and who we are currently targeting. So um, this is uh, exactly what we're going through at the moment. You're going through um, our USP, um, trying to isolate exactly um, how to communicate what we do and, and how people can, can um, become part of it, um, who we are actually trying to reach um, with, our, with, our, with our communications, either digital or in person, um, and, um, and what, what, what our issues are, what are our barriers to actually achieving that. Um, and it's only really by going through those steps um, that you can actually reach a, um, a useful um, strategy um, rather than like uh, Roy was saying, instead of just sort of throwing out messages um, on, on, so, on social media and hoping people pick it up, um, but to be a bit more targeted. Um, and, uh, and, and then you will actually get your message across much more effectively. Thanks, Michelle. I think we've got another question. Um, oh, we've got a question in from Lynn. Here, yeah, it's a tricky one. If I can find it now. Other than that, she's not an old person like me, but she's making the point that is there a chance that us, the older generation, will be left behind? And I guess to in maybe Rory could also pick up whether how open the academy is to to people who are sort of are 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 a bit older actually. Um, we, we've always had the door open. I've had many meetings with, with many different charities about, about different ideas. You know, sometimes people just come in and just say, you know, I want, I want to do the next Daryl Gorillas, you know, and you're just going, well, that was, that was quite a lengthy and planned out, very, very technical thing to do. But people understand that they have to be a little bit more um, kind of uh, innovative when it comes to the ideas now that come through. And, and it is hard to come up with those. And, um, you know, the Academy doors have always been open. Uh, the courses, like I said, are uh, there year in, year out. And, you know, we're talking with, uh, with government and stuff now about, um, um, you know, how we can extend this, you know, I affectionately like to call it fiscal stimulus forever, you know, where we're actually saying that we've shown a, a, a ramping up from 150 people we train roughly every year to, you know, over a thousand. And the, the, we, our waiting lists are still, you know, double that. So there's a clear demand for people wanting to know those skills. And it's not as easy. I mean, it, it, you can put stuff online you know the, the world is out there YouTube could tell you anything you want to know but it, it, it doesn't have that as, as you know as I was saying before about that that personal nature in yourself Kevin about that getting into a room and you know having that you know questions answered not just hoping that somebody's talking about it online and while a lot of universities uh, including in America as well as the UK uh, are thinking that they can just money grab and just go do you know what we've seen this online thing now we can just push out these courses people can do them from home and we you know we're going to rake that in it doesn't work the attrition rate on online courses is terrible uh people want a community people want to come together and actually say do you know what i'll join this online course but as long as we check in physically like every month and it, it's a new model that we're trying to to explore uh, this next the rest of this year and the next coming year where the materials that i've already got online i'm just i'm rehashing them out but what i'm saying is you can come to the first conversation you can do your work at home when you need to but let's come back and have a discussion about what worked and what did what didn't and you know it's that accessibility piece it's not just for the old generation it's for all all generations um but it's how do we get a limited resource which is the academy to be honest we're full at the moment um i'm actually kicking people out this evening because we've got three courses running simultaneously um and it's the people we've got a physical limit on that so I would say let's build communities around around this and actually get together and have a chat again, um, because putting it online is is a is a is an excuse um, rather than just going out and doing it. Thanks. Um, and if you've got time, I'm just going to add to that, Kevin. You know, I think <clears throat> back to sort of Lynn's point, it, it it could be, but I guess from my perspective, I'm reasonably reasonably privileged to be what is defined as zenial. So I'm 1981, which the, the psychology of that is you were kind of born into this 
reasonably ubiquitous digital world, but actually you were kind of <clears throat> pre-internet and, and, and a lot of those things. So you still had empathy for um, the, looking the other way. And so to that end, you know, I'm minded of a meeting a, a month ago where Jersey I Steadford were looking for a new website. And we, in this very boardroom, we had about 10, um, 60 plus people. And, you know, we had to explain the digital nuance very succinctly, but actually they were all very capable and empowered in the room to creatively think about ways to communicate and um, market themselves. So that, I think that's yeah. a great point, Ed, and I was probably being very rude to, it's to, to, to the older, older people because, you know, my mum, I don't suppose anybody thought my mum would come up in this webinar, but she is 83 and she, she's a natural for, for Facebook and iPads and everything else, you know, so I guess we shouldn't um, compartmentalise people, sort of, it, it's, it goes right across the spectrum. We've got some questions coming in from the audience, but I, I want to go to Michelle now to talk about um, getting, uh, using digital to, to generate operational efficiencies, collaboration management and, and admin. So perhaps you could pick some of that up and maybe give the, the, the Jersey Biodiversity Centre as an example, if that's possible, Michelle, because I think many of us have probably don't know just how interesting what you're trying to do actually is and how we can get involved with it. Yeah, so um, I'll, yeah, I'll use us as, as an example. But basically, um, I mean, our charity deals primarily with um, an extensive amount of data. So um, we talk sort of over 400,000 wildlife records and that's sort of our core. Um, and so digital uh, and being involved digitally is, is really fundamental in um, managing the volume of this data effectively. Um, so we have um, an online database um, which absolutely anyone can um, enter their wildlife sightings to. So they can use um, uh, our website or we have a specific app as well, um, which is very popular with all ages. <laughs> um, so it ties into what you were saying. Um, therefore, um, nearly all the data that we have that comes in now is actually um, uploaded without needing staff input. Um, which obviously saves a lot of resources, although we do still get a lot of um, people sending through spreadsheets, but those are the minority, um, uh, which means that um, our data is ready for access um, whenever it's needed. Um, and it also can be tailored um, for the user's end, re end requirements. Um, uh, and you compare this to our counterparts, we've got sort of the equivalent in, in Guernsey and Alderney, different uh, record centres that, uh, that record wildlife, um, and they're not digital at all. Um, so they're, they're the database is just on sort of Excel, um, so they have all their emails come through saying that people have seen different, different animals and things like that, and they've all got to be put in manually. Um, very time consuming, resource heavy, um, and also reduces the quality um, of, the, of, of the output data because of user error. Um, but we're very keen on um, new digital projects. I know that we've mentioned it a few times about COVID um, last year uh, and moving events online. We were very much um, an in-person education um, charity. So we did a lot of education events um, to try and raise awareness and train people up so that they can actually use, you know, use the apps and use the website effectively. Um, and we were going to potentially be, be uh, losing a, an incredible amount of data um, last year. Um, but we ch changed all of our um, in-person events to online and um, we turned what could have been a bit of a disastrous year for us and into something really positive and something that we can actually move forward with in the future and that we still do hold the occasional um, online event now um, and uh, so we can continue raising awareness and, 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 and um, educating um, and this is where the collaboration comes in um, because it really does create this um, community and it wasn't just in Jersey, there were people in the UK taking part, there's people around the world taking part in these events. Um, and that's really what we're trying to achieve is just creating this community of um, people that are passionate about wildlife. And like we were saying just now, digital 
um, can actually help you create this community um, it, and it can work in person as well as um, as, as well as as well as digital hand in hand um, and then from this we found that m monitoring our success has been much much more, much easier as well so we can communicate our progress um, through e-newsletters um, and also through so through uh, so social media um, and tell our volunteers and our staff members um, quite how important they are um, to the success of our charity so and, and do you, are you encouraging members of the community to add their observations to, to those of your other members sort of thing? I'm just looking at the website today and sort of looked like you were happy to receive observations from the, from the island, not just from uh, people who, who are experts, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's good that you've picked up on that point because that's something... Um, that we're trying to um, tweak a bit because it does, um, it's, it seems very scientific and off-putting at the moment. Um, so actually doing a big um, website overhaul and looking at our strategies and things like that, because yes, it is for absolutely any, anybody. And we're trying to make it much more inclusive um, because otherwise um, our, you know, our, our data set of wildlife is not gonna be representative of, um, of actually the species we have here. It's only gonna work if, if if someone's out and about and then they see, see a, you know, a plant or an animal and then they let us know, um, it's only going to work if all those people let us know rather than just a small subset um, of the population um, tell us what's very, something very specific, some specific fly um, that they've seen. Um, it's, it's, yes, it's getting that message out there. And for us, digital is, um, is a really positive um, way forward to do that and one we, we couldn't really do without so Thanks. and I, I can attest to that because I saw um, on social media sort of advertising for for the organization and then I happened to be out walking and uh, I started observing you know bumblebees out at a time that it was not quite expected so I started I'm also a data inputter into your organization uh, and it just happened about that I come across uh, on social media the work that you're trying to do and I thought you know, when I was out and about and seeing different species, I thought, actually, I'll, I'll take part in this. Oh, brilliant. That's brilliant to hear. Yeah, and it's so easy as well. And it's quite, it's quite satisfying and quite addictive, actually, as well. So, um, yeah, thank you for your record. But, uh, Becky, about operational efficiency and collaboration, I guess, for overseas aid, it's kind of very valuable. Uh, digital must be so valuable, given how far around the world you're working. Yes, I mean, I suppose that we, I mean, we have so many layers. We, you know, are a donor organisation. We are funding over 40 development projects, or I think 25 humanitarian projects and 14 Jersey charities to work overseas at this point in time. Uh, so much of it, when it comes down to reporting, when it comes down to communication, requires a, a digital platform, not just for us and our partners, but also for our partners and the different organisations that they're working with in the countries. Because sometimes, you know, for example, we'll be working with a UK-based organisation that is in turn working with uh, their local uh, branch, which in turn is working with biodiversity consultants, data researchers, um, and other types of organizations, perhaps capacity building organizations on the ground to provide specific training, perhaps with regards to sort of gender rights. So there's a whole layer and layer and layer of communication and collaboration that requires a, a digital interface. Um, from our perspective, we've really refined in the last five years our approach to all of this. Um, in 2019, we in introduced a, a database um, which is cloud cloud based uh, grant management system, and through that we can now basically uh, oversee all of our grants, and uh, we receive reports, all of the documents are uploaded in a centralized system, and really having that platform, having a cloud based platform that you can access anywhere, uh, that we can access and our partners can access, really really improves efficiencies in our in our relationships and in our operations of course you know we still call we uh we routinely have zoom conversations and, and email can never really be replaced but being able to centralize 
particularly when it's decision making processes uh, into a single cloud based system, it, it's very useful. It's uh, difficult now to imagine how it could have been before we had that system in place. Thanks, Peggy. Ed, getting more efficient, sort of, and collaboration, I think. What's, what's your view? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's that um, hybrid world. You know, I think, you know, uh, deeply um, honouring the digital virtual calls we're now having, including today. But I don't know about everybody else, but I certainly hit my Zoom wall about um, four or five months ago, and I was deeply satisfied when I could start meeting people back to, um, face to face. And, you know, I, I think I just echo what everyone else has said. Um, you know, you, you can't innovate in a sort of vacuum, right? You, you have to be taking any human exchange as, as a lesson to kind of further your cause. Um, and so, you know, calling upon whatever um, expertise to, to collaborate, whether it's um, a communication tool or the people around you, um, you know, and I, <clears throat> yeah, it's probably a shameless time for me to, to plug Unity, but I think it sort of deeply um, resonate with, given the audience today, which, you know, was a problem we were looking to solve originally around mental health, but as we, as we developed our idea, we realized that it wasn't a mental health tool. It was actually, there was a problem in the voluntary sector, which was numbers were kind of falling off. And so um, our tool um, that we, we're putting out into the universe, it, you know, it's gonna be free for, for charities and users ad infinitum, and basically allows any charity to upload um, all their volunteering opportunities whilst connecting to um, a huge database of um, people um, via their businesses to be able to fill those um, fill those opportunities, um, and um, we're very excited to to be launching it in Jersey. And it's a pretty unique tool, so we would open arms to have conversations with anybody um, who, who's on today um, about that. Um, and that's up that, and running, that, up and running now, Ed. Yeah, um, it'll be up and running um, in about two weeks. Um, and then in January, we'll be connecting to the corporate sector. Um, so there's effectively a, a trifecta. We've got um, voluntary organizations, individual users, and um, the corporate sector. And they all work together to fulfill these opportunities, um, not just in the, in the sort of um, maybe the, the traditional sense of volunteering, perhaps, but also looking at appropriating the corporate skills and expertise for the third sector. For example, um, you know, let's take one of the big four accountancy firms. Um, we will be promoting the idea that they use their skill set, uh, such as accountancy, to support um, the charitable sector, not just what may be considered a traditional voluntary opportunity. And I guess I should say before we move on to Rory is that that you're not you're going to be working with volunteer.je who do some great work down here and obviously uh, the AJC as well. So we're kind of all trying to help each other on, on, on this idea of getting volunteers and valuing volunteers, I guess, the point I feel quite strong. Absolutely, about. absolutely. Rory, but getting more efficient, collaboration, What's, yeah, I mean, what's but charities charities have a weird advantage in, in many respects, because one of the things that shocked me, I've worked in the educational sector, I've worked with Apple, Google and Microsoft, I've worked with all three of them. I have, I have very, very um, different views about which one is best. Um, but, you know, we're never going to move away from a uh, Microsoft world in the kind of business sector. And while Microsoft has many, many advantages, it's, it's also tried to scramble back, I think, on the on its collaborative working online. When you're hearing uh, Becky talking about that, it, it's not quite nailed it. Uh, I was I was on a Teams call this morning where someone was thought they'd open up an Excel sheet. It wasn't the live one. It was one they downloaded and they'd edit it all, and no one else could see it. And it was the usual conversation that we've we've had many times, I'm sure, over and over. Whereas Google, um, you can't do anything unless it's online. <laughs> it's it's just really really useful. And if you if you nail the the infrastructure down 
then it just saves so much time. Uh, I came from an organization where I didn't really get many emails. It was quite interesting to see that emails won't go away. I've actually struggled with emails since joining Digital Jersey. I think it's a little running joke within us because I used to get alerts. I used to get alert when someone had changed a document, when someone had added a form, when someone had did it. it wasn't, I wasn't getting information I was I, uh, that someone was passing on the buck. I always find an email is passing on the buck. You know, here's, here's the thing. Can you carry on? Uh, and then I have to email back going, you know, you've missed this out or the other. Whereas if someone was adding to a document i would just check in check it's going all right and leave people to autonomy so i think if you don't have legacy of, of if you think you're really far behind my, and my charity isn't using digital at all that's not actually a bad position to be in it can be a very refreshing one because you can build your structure up from the very very beginning in the right way and and, and I, my only advice to people is i do not touch offline documents everything online it just saves so much hassle access from everywhere mobile phones this that and the other especially if you're you're working with a charity uh, for free or you're, you're volunteering you're always on the fly or you're going between teams calls and other things you need that uh, that nimbleness but i was reading some of the chat coming through and while, while someone was i think more talking about a donation platform it was the idea of working things online people have now come accustomed to being able to turn up for something but also not to have the event almost streamed live at the same time. And when you talked about the older generation, I, I it seems like such a long time ago when we helped out the States go online using Teams Live. And it was, it was an interesting experience. And actually, I was really encouraging to see how people that didn't want to use tech did because they knew they needed to. But I would say to charitable organizations, the big names are there for a reason. If you're going to run a live event, you can do it off your phone with YouTube Live. It just takes two seconds to, to use a, a Gmail account or set one up for your organization and just press that live button and spend three pounds on Amazon on a tripod to stick it there. You know, there are lots of free tools out there. And you may be lured into saying, oh, there's a bespoke system out there that works. You'll need someone to support you with that. Whereas all the kind of big names and stuff like that have that support network already built into it. So for me, efficiency is, it's about being online only. And I, I know that sounds a bit weird for some people, but you'd be surprised, although it sounds scary, how many actual issues it removes. Thanks, Rory. Um, I suppose, you know, we talk about the sort of gigabit advantage that we have in Jersey, and I suppose that's makes being online practical and uh, at all times, I guess, really. We're, we're pretty lucky down here, aren't we? So just, Wait, just, to, yeah. just to add that, um, uh, as part of Unity as well, <clears throat> we recognise that it is a digital tool for, the, for the, the third sector. And, you know, there, is a, there, can, there can sometimes be a sort of fear to a new piece of digital uh, or a tool, but we are planning to empower digital ambassadors to be part of aiding um, charities with Unity itself, um, and therein creating another connection. Thanks. I'd like to come to Becky now to talk about compliance and governance and how digital can support those important areas. I'm, 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 I'm desperate to get rid of my telephone bill or my water bill to all these people for compliant purposes. So, I suppose. <laughs> well, I suppose I suppose there are there are multiple aspects and compliance. Uh, the support of digital with compliance and, and governance can't replace um, the role of people in in ensuring compliance uh, and good governance. Uh, but it can definitely facilitate um, the the work. I mean, we're all very familiar with the role of digital platforms for providing effective uh, due diligence. Uh, I recommend highly that everybody takes advantage um, of sort of digital due diligence uh, systems. But more importantly, from our perspective, you know, it's not just about compliance uh, in that sort of uh, KYC perspective, but compliance with agreements, compliance with policies and procedures. And that's why, you know, we talk about Rory, going fully online, or at least from our perspective, having a centralized uh, cloud-based system. By, through these methods and mechanisms, you can make sure that the organizations you're working with always have access to an up-to-date version of whatever policies and procedures or agreements they meant to be adhering to. 
uh, obviously, you know, if you send a document out by email, it can get lost, it can be misfiled, and you can find that people are, are sort of aligning with, with old and forgotten uh, versions of policies and procedures uh, that are no longer accurate and, and no longer um, the latest version. So a mixture of, you know, sort of going online, being able to sort of maintain those documents in a centralised place, such as through our, our grant management system, um, is really effective. And it's not just us who's doing that. Uh, you see other donors, but also other organisations achieving that with their partners. Um, you know, SharePoint, other sort of platforms they're using now to make sure that whenever someone's looking for information for cl compliance purposes, it's all centralised. Uh, we also have that from our reporting perspective. Um, we try and assist our organisations, our partners, uh, with their reporting requirements and, and compliance with their grant agreements by using our, our grant management system to provide reporting deadline dates that alert them in advance. So just if you forgot to read the grant agreement and you don't know there's a report coming up due to us, um, you know, online and digital systems can help with that and can streamline that and make sure that everyone's aware of what's due and when it's due. I mean, backing on as well from uh, what Michelle was saying about data, particularly within the charity sector, you know, we're constantly being asked, you know, are we achieving our goals? Are we achieving our aims? And we need data for that to be able to verify, you know, have, have we done what we said we were going to do? Did the training we provided to those healthcare workers actually result in greater attrition of, of knowledge and have it actually changed practices? So one thing we're really seeing, and it's quite exciting, particularly in the development sector, is the role of digital tools, even in rural communities, to collect this data. Um, tablets, phones for surveys, there's drones that Daryl are using in Madagascar, and geospatial mapping we're seeing in Rwanda now, um, to, to sort of take data for both compliance purposes to ensure that each organisation can say, yes, I know exactly what I'm doing and I'm complying with the terms of my grant or the terms of my organisation's um, objectives here. But also you can use this data. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to process it using um, uh, management information systems. An Excel spreadsheet can do the job if that's all you have. Uh, you can use this data to really direct strategy and then improve governance. So we're really seeing a whole sort of change in the system, I would say, over the last five years of using digital to sort of collate and coordinate documents that are key for compliance, get the data that you need in order to sort of comply and demonstrate compliance with your reporting and with your objectives. And on top of that, then being able to take learning from this data, learning from this digitally acquired um, data and, and analysed data, uh, which you can use through digital platforms, to sort of look at your organisation and say, is what we're doing still achieving our original charitable aims? Is what we're doing still achieving those objectives? And are we doing it as efficiently as we thought we would be doing it? Did this training actually work? Uh, did people actually engage with this aspect um, of this project we were undertaking? And it, this could be the same. It doesn't have to be all undertaken digitally. It doesn't, small organisations as well can use sort of digital methods like surveys um, and digital tools, even like Excel, to sort of get an understanding as to whether or not they're really aligning with their strategy and whether or not their strategy needs a new direction. And that's, that's good governance um, and that will improve compliance. So it, it's great to sort of see the changes in this area. And it doesn't take away from face-to-face uh, -face conversations and sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, talks with your trustees, uh, with the people you're looking to support. But by collating that information, we can really improve the quality of all of our work and um, sort of harness digital for sort of better change. Thanks Becky. Now we're starting to run out of time so we wanted to be able to uh, take some questions from the the the, the audience and we, we had a question earlier about uh, fundraising platforms um, from Stacey. I think I know the fundraisers forum are kind of active and one of the things I'd say to Stacey is to make sure she reaches out to, to the fundraisers forum and do some great work in the sector here. But uh, did Pallas want to take that one quickly? Oh, Stacey said she has already, so <laughs> very good, very digital. Uh, do people want to pick up on this fundraiser? I mean, it's, it's mainly just giving that people are using um, down here so I mean uh, ironically before Stacey 
could have certain second comment I was going to recommend um, race nation um, but yeah I think um, that there are a few tools out there but I think I'd probably do some research and maybe take that offline with, with Stacy to be specific um, yeah a good, yeah, good point yeah. about Race Nation, Ed, uh, Ed is, you know, I think Race Nation started out in Jersey and and has specialised in around charities as well. So I Yeah, know and I, I would encourage Stacey, wherever you are, in the um, ether to, if, 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 there was, if there was mixed feedback on the experience, then again, we've got the proximity of them being here in Jersey to help them um, work through that UX or sorry that user experience to kind of get it um, make it appropriate for, for, you, for what you're looking for. Um, Rory I see Springboard and the Community Foundation are working together so I think is that another opportunity? It is it is I think we're just crossing the I's and dotting the T's being usual Jersey tax and financial uh, think loopholes and things you have to go through just to make sure it, it's there but we're definitely going for that um, it was it was high on the priority list when we were going through springboard and and as kind of Ed says uh, there for the race nation one um, I, I would suspect you know it, it, it not to degrade anything but it, it's usually user error so there is a bit of a, an experience where maybe you do a video of someone donating a pound and post it online and show them that's how you do it you know obviously scrub out your, your, your card details but um the whole point is it, it isn't the easiest experience for someone that's never done it you know there can be some questions that come up where you're unsure you know we have so many times we say don't click this don't give these details over over the internet and then when you're donating online <laughs> there's a lot of those personal details that you, you're giving away so like you said it's that user experience and a bit of training to help them get over the line with with digital giving do we, uh, panelists, do you have any other comments about fundraising platforms? Certainly, I think, you know, what, one thing we've all learned through COVID is where, where fundraisers had to go digital because there was no choice. I think we've all learned quickly just how important they, they are. And also, I suppose that goes for so many of the other digital tools. The, the, the need to use them sort of drives you to make sure that you get familiar with them so I don't we'd have probably all been in St Paul's centre uh, if it hadn't been for this and I think it's for us for the AJC being able to run our programs digitally I think you know is making a big a big difference it's easier for people to attend so we plan to do to do more of them do we have any other questions from the audience Okay, well, I think if we don't, I think we can we could wrap up now. I mean, perhaps give a final word to each um, member of the panel as they just wanted a, one bit of advice that they would give to to charities about digital. So, do you want to start, Rory? Um, yeah, 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 and and like I said, I think we've we've hit the nail on the head many many times over. I said, well, while digital will solve a lot of problems, it won't solve every problem. And, you know, when we talk about the, your strategies and your leadership, for, for me, it's community. Jersey is a small place and therefore, you know, engaging with your community is easier and the digital doesn't always replace that. You know, Ed, Ed's project there with you've got like the unity service and stuff like that. It's about bringing communities together. And while, you know, why I am a proponent of using the big names, with Jersey, you've got to ask that question, are you going to get lost in the ether? And there are local uh, tools and local facilities and people that you can draw upon. And so, yeah, digital can be the answer, but do just talk and engage. Ed, your final word from you? Um, I guess it's probably maybe less a bit of advice, more a question that, that people don't necessarily have to answer in the chat. But it appears to me that, you know, we've got a really healthy cohort here. And my question would be, you know, do we think that, you know, the cohort would benefit from almost a course um, in these exact topics? Because we've had an hour to cover a hell of a lot here um, and each in their own right, be it, um, you know, compliance, creativity, digital, all probably deserve three or four hours at least in their own right. I wonder if there would be merit in somehow curating a course specific to the charitable sector that, enables, empowers, connects them, um, that, that, that can at least begin to flesh out with a bit 
more detail what we're all um, contributing in, in an hour to here. Yeah. Question rather than a piece of advice. Yeah, perhaps. as a great point, Ed, as a, we're, we're now starting to plan our own training programme for next year. So we're always help, uh, looking to members to give us feedback about what should be included. And I'm, I'm sure there'll be some digital content to that for, for next year and, and moving on. Uh, Michelle, final word from you. that um, charity, charity resources can be uh, uh, li limiting, but um, it's worth putting aside um, time and resources and some funding if, if you possibly do it to, to try and develop your digital strategy and, um, or, or improve it because it, it will make a big difference in the long term um, to how, how your charity runs and, and, the, and the feedback and the outputs that you get from, from your work and from your, um, the people that you're trying to engage with. Um, so definitely just put aside some resources if you can. Thanks, Michelle. Becky, final word. Mm. I suppose uh, if you're looking at your organisation and you're seeing that there are digital innovations that could support you in improving your efficiency or your operations, my word would be don't be afraid, reach out, find the right people who'll be able to assist you with this because if we've now got people walking around rural Nepal holding tablets, um, maybe anything is possible. Thanks. Well, thanks, panellists. Thanks to everybody who's joined the webinar today. Um, well, this won't be the last. Thank you so much.